Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dan Height, and this is Flies in the Kitchen. Today I get to share with you a conversation with a guy whose career I followed for over 20 years. Uh, First as a member of a four-piece folk band from Northern Virginia called Eddie from Ohio, to a humanitarian bringing music to children living in refugee camps in Africa and Greece, to writing and performing in a play based on his life with his father, who was a Holocaust survivor and an immigrant to the United States. I'm talking about Robbie Schaefer. When I was budding as a songwriter, I really gleaned a lot from this guy. Not just in his craft, but in his depth as a creator of meaningful and poignant stories that he told so well in his music. I got a chance to FaceTime with Robbie several weeks ago, and we had a really great conversation. I also got a sneak preview of the next play he's working on called The Blue Poppy. And I tell you what, this one is going to be amazing. During this episode, we'll be talking about certain things, and I want you all to be in the loop as much as possible, which is why it's really important to be checking out this episode's page uh, at danheight.com, because I'm going to be including a few links and videos so you can follow along. You know, as I was looking back on a few things, I realized that the day that this episode is posted, um, March the 15th, it will be exactly two years since I uploaded episode one of Flies in the Kitchen uh, with my very first guest, Kelly Zulo. We recorded that episode inside her newly purchased RV, and we had a really, really great conversation. It made me realize that this is something that I really like doing, just sitting and chatting with creative people who have a story to tell. Now, this being episode 13, I'm sure that if you do the math, you'll realize that I don't put one of these out every week, not even every month, to be honest with you. You know, it's not my day job. I wish it were, but I try to put them out as often as I can. Um, I hope you understand, and I hope you stick with me. I do have a lot of people that I'm making plans with for some really good conversations. So if you haven't subscribed yet, or if this is the first time you've listened, won't you subscribe and have a listen to some of the past episodes? Kelly's a good one to start with. I've spoken with songwriters, a painter, a photographer, a filmmaker, authors, poets, and playwrights. And that's just the beginning. So hang out, won't you? Drop me a line. I'm all over social media at F-I-T-K pod. And if you like what you hear, feel free to hop over to iTunes and leave me a review. It'd be a big help. All right, so let's kick off my interview with Robbie Schaefer with one of my favorite tracks from Robbie's In the Flesh album called Fly. I'm kind of small for my age, but I've learned to be quiet. Did you know if you're quiet? Enough, you become invisible, indivisible. Ours is a family of three. There's my mom, dad, and me. I'm the only one who's quiet. I wish they'd shut up and try it. But don't underestimate me. I'm seven years. can fly out of here, I can fly out of here, I can fly. I'm kind of smart for my age, it's only a gift if you use it, it don't choose you, you must choose So did you mention that you had first started playing guitar? Um, in Switzerland as a kid? Yeah, I first started playing guitar in Switzerland. I was seven years old and um, asked my uh, 
my folks for a guitar and they were dumb enough to give me one or smart enough, <laughs> depending the way you look at it. And, uh-huh. um, I was going to a British run school. It was, um, the international school, the UN school there. And mm-hmm. there was a teacher uh, named Miss Ball and she was, um, sort of a self-taught folky. If you, you know, can mm-hmm. imagine this is around, uh, I guess, uh, 1973. Mm. And, um, and so she started giving me lessons, uh, there at the school and yeah, that, that's, how, that's how I began. She taught me all sorts of, um, bad habits that I still have today. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. So then when you came into, came to the States, you had had this foundation and you, you just decided that's just, you just wanted to keep going and, uh, you found every opportunity or you just, uh, um, um yeah, I, I kept taking lessons here uh, in the States till I was about 14. Uh, so we moved back when I was around 9 or 10 and uh, kept taking lessons till I was about 14. I, um, yeah, it wasn't even sort of a decision for me. I, I, I can't tell you why I asked for a guitar in the first place. Well, I sort of can. Mm-hmm. I, had this, mm-hmm. I had this friend named Ben in, in, in Geneva. He was American as well, and he played okay. the guitar. And I just... I loved that he played the guitar and I, and I, so I wanted one. So, um, yeah, I think I was just always drawn to it. Something in me knew that this was a tool that was going to help me, um, express myself. And, um, I just became dear friends with it, you know, I went, not mm-hmm. to sound too precious about it, but I, I, you know, my mom will tell you that I, I, I would play for hours and hours and hours up in my room anything, right. you know? Um, so, and that just continued when I came back to the States and, um, kept taking some lessons until I was 14 and then just kind of got tired of the structure of that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I had had a couple of teachers, Miss Ball being one of them. And then my first teacher here, a guy named John Overholt, who lives in Michigan now, he's, um, he, they were great because they were teaching me songs. Mm-hmm. And it was really joyful for me. And through those songs, I would learn technique and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I ended up taking lessons from this guy who was, who was teaching me essentially classical music. Um, and it was a lot more theory and structure. And um, it bored me to tears. And mm-hmm. so that's when I quit the lessons. <laughs> yeah. So what were your first songs, like the ones that you've written, what were those like? Um, I think they were all called Girl. Yeah. Yeah. Every single one of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> would you like to share one of those? Uh, I would if I could. I can't remember them really. <laughs> girl. Oh, girl. I don't know. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Th- this was elementary school. I was already writing songs in elementary school. And um, wow. uh, Mike Clem from Eddie from Ohio had uh, and mm-hmm. I had met and um, actually formed a band in elementary school. Okay. And so we played everything from we covered... Um, you know, if you're old enough, you might remember um, the Bay City Rollers. We covered music from them. We covered, we loved Kiss. We loved the Beatles. Um, nice. And so we covered those things, but but we also wrote songs, both of us. So, nice. Yeah. Well, the I, I want to talk about that, too, because the... the 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 kind of, the differences in songwriting between between you and Mike are just lovely and so how it, the way that it um, um, comes together and and creates just a really cool set for your shows <laughs> your yeah. your songs and his songs and I know that Julie writes some but but uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm I've always I was telling I think I told um, I think I told you earlier that that when I was, you know, I was in college when I first heard the band play and, uh, somebody brought me to a, a show and, and I didn't know who you were, but I got there. And of course it was at either, you know, the South main cafe, you know, Blacksburg or Pedro's or one of those, one of those places that there's just standing room only for people to jump up and down and yeah. know, be crazy. <laughs> and, and, and I got there and it was really one of the first times I'd been to, and I, I mean, I was a, was and still am kind of a painful introvert. So I never really went out much <laughs> in college, but it was the first time I'd really been out in, in a community that just was so impassioned over, 
uh, over the same thing and over this music and hearing, you know, you did all your, all your songs and everybody was singing along and screaming out. And I thought, gosh, this is a pretty cool band I can get behind. And, and I really did. And I followed them and I did, I followed you guys for a long, long time. I thought you were great. But then later on, you know, when I started being more serious about my own songwriting, I started listening a lot more closely to your music, uh, and mm-hmm. to, you know, and to Mike's music and just all the songs that you guys played. And then of course your solo albums too. I listened to all that. And, and it was the first time I'd kind of transitioned between just a fan uh, of a band, you know, to fanboy status, <laughs> you know, to, uh, kind of a colleague of, of learning, I suppose, and just really studying and thinking, wow, these are really really good songs and really good, good writing and depth. And, and, um, and so it was, it, it's just a really was a cool moment for me to, to see that happen. Yeah. That's fabulous to hear. Yeah. I don't, I don't hear stuff like that very often and I don't know how often it happens, but, um, yeah, Mike and I are, are, you know, as, as you obviously know very well, very different writers and the best I ever heard it described, uh, was years and years ago. Somebody said, well, yeah, it's obvious. Um, Mike writes from the outside in and you write from the out, from the inside out. Oh, okay. And I think most of the time that's probably true, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, most of the time for Eddie from Ohio, those two approaches to writing have complemented one another, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, and that's, and you guys are going on, what, 25 years now? Yeah, it's uh, actually this year. I mean, let me see. Uh, wow. No, 29. 29 <laughs> years. Gosh. Yeah. 1991, February of 1991 was our very first um, show. So I guess actually 28 years. We just passed the 28-year anniversary of the band. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that band, Eddie from Ohio, started... I mean, how did did that even begin? Um, Like most good things, it began by accident. Um, Mm -hmm. It... uh, I... I had studied telecommunications in college and uh, thought I would follow in my father's footsteps in the telecommunications world, which is where he was working at the time. And so I went up to Boston, got a job and lasted about five months and hated it. And so I moved home and I thought I was, you know, I was 23, I guess. And um, I thought, well, maybe I'll just play music for a while. And so I was kind of making a go of it just on my own as a solo musician. I'd written lots of songs uh, while I was up in Boston, while I was living up there. But mostly I was playing in corners of bars, you know, uh, for four hours a night for 75 bucks and, you know, playing Margaritaville and that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and it was fine. I was 23. It was, you know, it was fine. And, um, But I knew Mike, of course, from all the way back from elementary school, and we had gone to high school and then college together as well. And Julie, I had known also from, we had gone to neighboring high school, so I knew her through the music community. And and Eddie had gone to JMU, where Mike and I went to college. So one night I was just playing, it was like a Monday night or a Tuesday night, and I was playing in this... um, restaurant essentially um here in the in the dc area Mm. in the bar area of the restaurant and there were there were five people there there was me there was the bartender um sorry four people and mike and julie (laughs) (laughs) and that was it and so i'm just sitting there playing and i i kind of broke into um the song amy by pure prairie league Mm-hmm. You know, Amy, what yeah, you yeah. want to do? And yeah. um, and so Mike and Julie start, you know, added three part harmony onto mm-hmm. that. And I just said, you know, maybe we should just play like we should have like a little band and and do acoustic covers and focused on acoustic guitar and harmony on the weekends or whatever, because mm-hmm. Mike and Julie both had had day jobs then. Mm-hmm. And. So that's what we did. We started that little thing and Eddie came along pretty quickly after that and said, yeah, I got nothing going on. Let me, let me mm-hmm. play with you guys. And grab my djembe and come and 
Yeah, he didn't. Yeah. He, in fact, he had never <laughs> played hand drums at that point. He was just a really? he had just played drum set all through. Um, but you know, he realized this was an acoustic thing. His very first, mm-hmm. our very first rehearsal today, he literally played on on a an empty Budweiser cardboard box. Oh, perfect. Um, and <laughs> so yeah, so it was just supposed to be like something to do and and play mm-hmm. some music and maybe make a little extra money or something. Mm-hmm. But. Um, Within a year, we had started to write some songs and just found like we had some sort of an interesting blend. And so, um, and people started following us here in the DC area. So that's, that's kind of how it got started. And within that year, I think, I think about after about a year, maybe a touch more is when Mike and Julie actually quit their day jobs and we just said, okay, we're going to make a go for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you start hitting the college college towns and which yep. is perfect because now that, that demographic is going on you know cruises and <laughs> you guys did the cruise for a couple of years <laughs> didn't you <laughs> the, that demographic is as old as we are yeah yeah um, uh we did we did a bunch i don't know how many cruises we did fan cruises but probably like i think we did like maybe seven six or seven yeah. something like that um awesome and yeah those were fun where you know you know, we get to go to warm places and mm. and um and and sit on the beach and and play music in a pretty informal um setting either on the mm. beach or on the ship and uh for for people who are um pretty crazy about what you do and that's 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 yeah. pretty special yeah yeah well and somehow you've managed to keep it going for this long without completely killing each other so that's a real plus, especially <laughs> being out on the road and doing a lot of shows. I mean, you're doing less shows now, but yeah. um, you're, I, I tell you, the arc of your career has been real fun to watch. Oh, thanks. Our, yeah, I mean, at our height, I think we were, we were doing 150 to 200 dates a year mm-hmm. um, for a lot of years there. And um, that was our main source of income, you know, because we were, we were, um, our own record label, we formed our own record label. And so therefore we were, you know, our income was really come from coming from playing live and building a grassroots following all over the country and in Canada some as well. And, and, and selling CDs, especially when we had a new album out going and hitting the road and, and getting in front of people. So, um, yeah, I don't know, you know, I think we, I think we, um, I've said this often to the band these days. I, I think we always, as a band, without really saying it explicitly, prioritized our friendships, even over artistry. And that's not to denigrate what, we, what we've what we accomplished musically or artistically. But um, we were more likely, rather than to draw a line in the sand when it came to artistic differences, most of the time we would prioritize our friendships over that. And, um, and in all honesty, I think there's probably a trade off there. You know, the trade off being that I think that much, um, much, uh, acute artistic growth happens through tension and conflict. You know, it's why you see so many bands that can't stand each other, but they're great. Um, uh, so, and I, and I, so I think there's a truism there and perhaps we as a band might have grown more artistically than we ever did if we had, um, put art first and friendship second. Um, but I'll bet you we wouldn't be friends anymore and mm-hmm. we are and, mm-hmm. um, and I wouldn't do it any differently. Right. Okay. So then as... Eddie from Ohio started playing fewer and fewer shows. Um, that opened you up to doing other creative things like, like one voice. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, still really just amazed by one voice about just how far it has stretched. Um, and I'd love to, well, first of all, once you just describe what it is and, you know, what its mission is and sure. know, how that's been going lately. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's another example of um of wonderful things that that happened by accident as mm. 
as long as you are willing to step in and dive in, not knowing what's coming next. And while, you know, Eddie from Ohio was kind of an example of that, um, One Voice absolutely has been an example of that. Um, I was, as the band slowed down our touring, um, I got the chance to uh, have a job as a, have a radio show on Sirius XM, satellite radio. And yeah, and so I was, uh, I was actually the music director of the kids and family channel there for about six years and, um, and also had a, had a nightly show. And somewhere in the middle of that, um, I got this, an urge simply to do something that felt a little bit more meaningful. And, uh, looking back on it, it was an urge to use art as service to people. Um, and I didn't really know it then. Uh, but, um, I had this idea that maybe I would go somewhere in the world that was kind of underserved and, um, and play music with them and record their own music and sort of have a musical conversation with youth mm. and maybe turn that into a radio show on Sirius XM. And, um, you know, ultimately the mission of One Voice, since you kind of had asked that, uh, what is, mm. is that um, to connect and empower youth around the world through music and the arts um, in order to affect social change in their communities. And so, um, you know, I didn't have any of that language yet, but through a series of events and it's a whole nother story, but, uh, through a series of events that happened kind of quickly and surprisingly, and it was very much a whirlwind, um, on behalf of Sirius XM, I actually went to Uganda and I'd never been to Africa before. And, um, I went and spent a week at a school, at a primary school there, exchanging um, music and made a radio special out of it. And from that, I realized that I wanted to do a lot more of that and I wanted to put it to better use, not just a radio show, but actually affecting social change in the communities where I would go. And so that's how One Voice started. People warned me after I came back from there. I think it took me a year to start the process of actually um, beginning a nonprofit because it's a lot of paperwork and not a lot of fun. And everybody said, mm -hmm. don't do it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and yet after a year, I just sort of felt I, I couldn't see any other way to do what I wanted to do other than starting it as a nonprofit. So that's what I did. Mm. Wow. And so what has it been, what have you seen through that with the youth and, mm. and the... Um, and the way things are where, because it says you're out there and, um, well, for example, like the refuge refugee camp in Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's been happening there? Yeah. So, you know, the one voice projects have, have taken a different shape, um, almost mm -hmm. every single time. Our very first project was in official project was in Tanzania, um, just outside right. of Arusha. And, um, I took a team with me, you know, musicians and a videographer and a photographer and so on. And, and, um, essentially when all was said and done, what we did was we recorded music, we taught music, we learned music, and we used all of that through a radio campaign on Sirius XM when we came back to the States to raise money to build a secondary school for these kids. Cause mm. the kids we had all worked with were in primary school and in Tanzania, if there is no secondary school in their area, which there wasn't, um, then uh, the girls probably get married around the age of 13, 14, 15, and the boys try to go to work. Um, and so we were part of building a secondary school there. But more importantly, it was the kids who had lent their voices, you know, who had we had recorded their songs. We had recorded songs even that we taught them or that they had taught us, but them performing these things that actually were the engine that built this school. And to watch that happen and to go back the following year um, and stand in these brand new classrooms um, with these same kids and seeing that they had the knowledge that they were empowered 
to build something in their community. And that, that power came from within them. It was already there. It was their own voices, their own creativity. It was a really powerful thing. Um, and it was a real learning experience for me. So we did some other projects similar to that, not always school building, but service oriented and, and that the, the engine of that was always the kids' creativity. We did projects in Kenya and in um, Nicaragua and in India. Uh, but the project that you're talking about, which was, I think, in 2016, was that we saw an opportunity to go to the uh, Greek island of Lesbos, which at the time was where, you know, if people can remember... It was all over the news all the time. There were there were these people in orange vests um, fleeing the Syrian war, and uh, in these little rubber dinghies, you know, and dinghies that were built for twenty five people would have seventy five people, and people were falling overboard and drowning in the sea. And and anyway, the island of Lesbos was the closest place to the coast of Turkey, which is where many of these people had walked to from Syria. Um, so Lesvos was this tiny idyllic island that was just getting overrun. It was completely unprepared for the numbers of refugees that were showing up, um, and trying to put together these makeshift camps. And so one of the things we did was there was a smaller camp, not one of the major ones. It was called Pikpa camp and it only had a capacity of about a hundred people, but it was a camp that was set up for kind of the most vulnerable refugees, people, that were sometimes unaccompanied minors, um, people, kids and adults with special needs, um, people who had traveled but had been injured during the fighting uh, by shrapnel or you know bomb blasts, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Basically people who could not easily travel on and try to make it to mainland Europe at that time and who might be there for a while. So we went there and it was a very different thing than uh, the community building that we'd done before it was really about crisis response and trauma response. Mm -hmm. And so there was me as a musician, but we also brought a friend of mine, um, uh, Pamela Sukum, who's a fabulous, fabulous painter, and um, brought her as an art therapist. And um, and so we we worked with them. You know, it was very loose, and you kind of have to be in the refugee camps. Um, you can't have too much structure and everything's going to fall apart anyway, because people are moving, you know, every day and people are sick and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But that's what we did. We spent a couple of weeks there. And I guess my biggest takeaway from all of that was, um, maybe not, certainly not what I thought it was going to be. And maybe not what most people would think it, nothing about it felt good. Nothing about it felt satisfactory. Um, if anything, what it did was it made me feel um, acutely like I and we were not enough. Oh, wow. And that's a horrible, horrible, helpless uh, feeling of despair to realize that I had what I had to give was simply not enough. And yet, it was worth me giving it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that's, that's kind of what it was. It wasn't really about accomplishing anything huge. We weren't really there long enough to kind of engage in therapy one-on-one with kids and, and with, with adults. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't really our job. We weren't trained therapists. Uh, you can probably hear my dogs in the background. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, But deeply, it felt like, it felt like, you know, we're not really able to do very much to help these people's lives. And that's probably true for everybody here trying to help. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet you simply do what you can and literally meet these people eye to eye and connect with them and remind them that they're not forgotten. Well, and, and really that's, that's what they need right they 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 need to feel like they haven't been forgotten and i think and so that, yeah you're that 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 concept of of i don't know one voice it's it it can be enough to make a difference in one person and so it's a 
Yeah. I don't know. It's, 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 I'm sure it's humbling and disappointing when not everything can be fixed the way that you want it to be. But, um, but I think it's fair to say that there are little changes that have a, have an, a potential of snowballing. Don't you think? I, I do. And yeah, I think, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's, um, it is humbling and it is a realization that you can't fix everything. Right. Uh, and maybe sometimes you can't fix anything, but you mm-hmm. can still show up. Right. And showing up is, is really all of it. It's everything. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it is at once humbling. It's deeply, like I said before, um, unsatisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's really important for all of us to, to show up for one another, uh, whether that's in our yeah. own neighborhood or half a world away, you know? Well, that, that urge that you felt at the beginning, you know, the urge to feel like doing something meaningful and doing something, um, with purpose, do you feel like, you feel like for the most part that you've, been filling that urge? Yeah, for the most or part. Satisfying it? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do for the most part. I, you know, it is, um, of course, understanding what that urge is and mm-hmm. it has, has morphed over the years and, mm-hmm. and then how to, how to manifest that and, and bring that into being has morphed as well. You know, obviously mm-hmm. just even in the way that the one voice projects have morphed. Um, so, um, but to be of service to others, um, through whatever, whatever tools and gifts you have, I think is essential mm-hmm. to the way I walk through the world. And, mm-hmm. um, and music is the primary tool and gift I have. So, mm-hmm. well, I want to, I want to talk about another, well, another urge that it seems as though you have been uh, satisfying, and that's to um, memorialize your dad hmm. in, in yes. uh, light years. Um, it, 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 you know, a lot of, I don't know, it's, I think it's a wonderful thing to see you go from uh, putting all of yourself into these projects in in Africa and uh, in Greece and 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 then turning around and putting again all of yourself into something so personal and so um, close to home for you. Um, you know, I I've been. Like I said, I've been listening to this 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 album, and it's not anywhere close to a full representation of the play. Uh, it's music from the play, right? And yeah. For me, I've been listening to the to the album, and I can't even get through the first track <laughs> of the burst of silence <laughs> without just weeping because it is so powerful and i and and i think i figured out what that's about and i think because you know i am you know i'm a guy in my 40s i have my my dad is still living he's in his 70s um and recently i was talking to somebody about how grateful i am to be a man in his 40s and have a relationship with his dad when he is in his 70s yeah you know certainly and 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 hope and my mom too in her seventies and hopefully I'll be able to have that relationship when I'm in my fifties with my parents when they are in their eighties and mm-hmm. have that dynamic. Um, it's changing, you know, all the time. But to to watch and I watched the video too of the burst of science that that video that y'all produced on that yeah yeah that that scene. Um, and I'm not sure if it was a direct scene from the play or if that was something you produced f- uh, just for that. No, it was, it was more of like a promo. Yeah. So it wasn't actually, it okay. wasn't, so it wasn't staged the way it, right. it was staged during the play and all that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I kind of got that sense. However, when you sang 
your part. And Bobby Smith turns and looks at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> I know. how are you able to get through that <laughs> with the way that he was looking at you? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. He's... Um... He's an extraordinary human being. I, I, I just had lunch with Bobby um, last Friday. It's mm -hmm. the first time I'd, I'd really sat down. I'd seen him since, since the show had closed, which was uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe about 11 months ago is when the run finished. Uh -huh. um, and, but we hadn't really sat down. And uh, he's just one of my favorite people on the planet and an extraordinary mm -hmm. actor. And mm -hmm. he was able to really get inside. You know, he never met my father. My father had died, uh, well, we're coming up on four years ago. So mm -hmm. he never actually met my dad. Um, and he actually had a very um, uh, combative relationship with his own father. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, But he also did have a very close uh, supportive relationship with his grandfather. So I think he drew on that a lot. But right. I'm not really sure... I, I think he's just really, really talented and he's mm -hmm. a deep, empathetic person. And mm -hmm. um, he took to the story of Light Years right away. And how did I get through it? Um, barely. That's how I got yeah. through it. You know, I, I you know, I, um, I certainly remember the first day of rehearsal and sitting around a table and reading through the script. It was just a read through, you know, nobody was inflecting, nobody was acting that much. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I, I just, I went into another room and sobbed. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, light years is an incredibly personal thing and mm -hmm. incredibly intimate and, uh, definitely a part of my grieving process. Yeah. Yeah. And w would you just, I don't know, in a paragraph, <laughs> uh -huh. maybe describe the, the synopsis of the show? Sure. Um, so essentially Light Years is, is the story of a father and a son who um, love each other but don't quite understand one another. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially... It is a story also about how do we take the silent or shuttered things that came before us uh, in generations before us, and how do we lovingly shine a light on those things in order to move them forward? You know, I, 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 I've had this feeling, this um, conviction that, we all get to essentially move the story of our family, of our community, of our country even, forward just one step. We take what's handed to us. Um, we shine a light if we're brave enough, and it does take courage. On We shine a light on the parts that were shuttered away or, or shoved into a closet. And by doing that, that is a form of love. And by doing that, we bring them into the light and we can only do so much. We have our own things that we shove into the closet, right? And then we pass it on to the next generation, whether that's our, our children or, um, you know, friends that we know or, or whoever that is. So Light Years is largely about that. I, I found in real life, and this is a big part of the show, that it was incredibly poetic that my father, who... Um, and I'm not giving any, anything huge away here, but my father was a Holocaust survivor mm -hmm. who never used that term ever. And I never knew he was a Holocaust survivor till I was in my 40s. Um, now, I no knew kidding. that he had been very young and, um, and been through the war in some sort of murky way, but I never thought of him as a Holocaust survivor. Um, mm -hmm. And of course he was, because he was a Jewish kid in Europe um, on the run. And it turned out he had spent time in a, in a camp and, and all sorts of stuff. But I found it incredibly poetic that this man, who then came to the United States when he was 21 to start a new life, um, and was all about security and 
uh, safety and making sure that nothing like this ever happened again to him or to his family. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and yet he's the guy who gave me a guitar when I was seven years old, when I asked for it mm. and that he unwittingly, I'm sure gave me the tool that I would later use to shine a light on, to give voice to things that he could not give voice to. Yes. And I found and still find that to be so incredibly beautiful. And I think I am probably far from alone in that experience, um, whatever the tool might be for different people. So ultimately that's what light years is about. You know, it, it is about a father and son and it is about a Holocaust survivor. And it is about trying to find ways to love one another when we don't completely understand each other, but it's mostly a meditation Mm. on um, how we live our lives and then how we pass those lives on to others. Well, it it seems like it must have been such a cathartic thing. Um, I I don't know what... I mean, you had, what, eight shows a week. It's probably hard to remain cathartic for eight nights a week. It'd probably be exhausting, but... Mm. But but it seems like I would imagine at least that opening night uh, and maybe every night since I don't know it just seems like it would be such a um, an honoring testament um, to your dad to that relationship whatever whatever you know forms that relationship took at different parts of your life mm-hmm. but it was just a real uh, honoring moment it would seem to be. Yeah, I, I hope I hope it was. Um, I, I, I that's how I felt about it, and even when there are you know some difficult things said about him in there, um, mm-hmm. I um, you know in I, I'm I'm not an uh, an incredibly observant Jew, um, you know, religiously speaking, but. There is something you know when a parent dies called in in the Jewish world called Kaddish, mm-hmm. which is a prayer of mourning, and uh, you know a son is supposed to say Kaddish every day uh, for his father uh, for the first month, mm-hmm. and then at certain times throughout throughout um, the following years. And it is just this repetition of a prayer of remembrance and, and mourning. And it occurred to me well after Light Years finished, or the production finished, that the two and a half years that I spent writing it and then performing it eight nights a week was my, was my Kaddish. It was my form of saying a prayer for him. And yeah, it moved me through my grieving, but it also helped me understand him better. It also Mm -hmm. brought me closer to him. And certainly there were a lot of cathartic moments throughout the writing of it. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, it was cathartic performing it as well. I, 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 you know, the... I learned a long time ago when Eddie from Ohio, we... um, we agreed to play that there were, there was a fan who had tragically lost her, um, I think six month old baby and asked mm-hmm. if we would sing at the funeral. And we did. And I remember before we went out to do that, um, Julie, um, our singer being really, really nervous about being able to get through a song, um, at, at that kind of a funeral. Um, mm-hmm. and I said to her, um, yeah, you, you can't fall apart. This is your job today. Your job is not to be emotional. Your job is not to be comforting to them in an emotional way. Your job is to be comforting to them by doing your job. Mm-hmm. I think that, at least for me, that's the only way you get through that kind of a moment. Mm-hmm. And that's largely how I got through the performances of Light Years. And it was a tough balancing act. You're, I mean, you're absolutely right in that it's impossible to shut off all the emotion there. Mm-hmm. And I shouldn't because I also acted in it. Right. So I shouldn't, right. I, I, I can't cut off all the emotion, but I had to go to work every day. Um, it was my job to present this story to an audience in the best way that I could. And if I were to get overly emotional on stage to the point of it getting maybe a little uncomfortable, that's not fair to them. Right. And it's not 
even doing the job. It's not fair to me as a writer. It's not doing the job I set out to do, which is to tell this story the best I can. So, um, so there were little specific moments where I allowed more emotion to creep into my voice or into my action or into my eyes. But, um, largely that's how I got through it. I was going to work every day with it. And, and Bobby actually, who played my father helped me a lot with that. He's such an experienced actor. And, um, and on closing night, um, we did the final performance. And as always, after the bows, I would walk off stage hand in hand with Bobby And we walked all the way off stage and we hugged and I went into my dressing room and I collapsed on the floor sobbing. Mm. Um, And it felt like uh, all the catharsis kind of flooded out then. Wow. Well, I'm dying to know if I will ever be able to see this show. Me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I know it was such a limited run, and yeah. I was—I really wanted to see it, and then it was, and then it was over. Yeah. And uh, I, I, do you think it will ever? Um, you know, do you think you'll? Yeah. First of all, w- would it would it be difficult to just release it out to other theaters? would you feel like you would need to be a part of it or is it something that you would be able to let go of you think? Yeah. Yeah. Both can be true. You know, um, it's the way the theatrical process works, you know, light years is certainly not a finished play. Um, this was just the first production and there, there will be others. Um, where and when I still don't know. Okay. Um, but, uh, for now, you know, the way a theatrical, the, the process works through writing a, a show like this is you write and you write and you rewrite and you rewrite and then you workshop it and then you rewrite some more and you mm-hmm. even do rewrites and change things. We were, you know, we cut a song from it um, the day, the night before it opened. Um, so, wow. so, so changes are getting made right up until um, the last moment and then it gets kind of frozen it is what it is for that run. And, you know, the, the production at at signature theater was, was four weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but now there's the opportunity to kind of dig back in and pull it apart, which of course is a scary thing again. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and decide what worked best and what didn't work as well. And it's really hard. I'm not used to that process and, um, I'm, uh, it's a really uncomfortable thing for me, mm-hmm. but it's also necessary. So, um, so for now, uh, I think it's really important that I would be in it wherever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, a, because I want to, I want to do it more. Um, mm-hmm. but B, because the way it's written, I don't know that right now it would have the same emotional heft and impact if, if it was just a, another actor playing the part of me. Right. I think there's something to the way it's written and how intimate it is. Um, there's something to the audience, audience knowing that that actually, all of this actually happened to me. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I would love to do it more. And Signature Theater has been shopping it around to other theaters. And there have been several... Um, actually many over the year, uh, the last year since, since it closed at signature, um, you know, bites of interest, some more serious than others. And actually we should know in the next maybe six weeks or so, we should have an idea, um, where it's going to go next. Um, nice. and, uh, and if we don't, if nobody, you know, says yes in capital letters right now for this <laughs> next season, then, um, then it'll, it'll, it'll show up somewhere else, you know, after that, because it's not finished its life. I can, it's, it's pretty obvious to me. Cool. Well, that's, that's all I needed to hear. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so now you're working on another one, right? The blue poppy. Apparently I caught the bug. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Cause, uh, you know, I, I don't think we stated it, but yeah, light years was the first time I'd ever written, something for theater. Um, yeah. it was brand new to me. So the form is brand new. The process is brand new to me. And I mean, it wasn't I, that I, 
I, I mean, I could speak, I could talk, I could ask you a million questions just about that. From going to a songwriter of folk songs and 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 ballads and things to creating something so enormous and massive, um, hmm. how how that happens, but but I think well, that, it's. I mean, it's, I can tell you in short, in oh, brief, good. it's, it's, it's both, <laughs> it's both harder and easier than, than doing what I've usually done for right. the last, um, 30 years. But, um, mostly like, you know, you see a theme here. <laughs> I didn't set out to write a musical, sure. just like I didn't set out to start a nonprofit or set out to start a band. Um, uh, I, in the six months after my father passed away, I felt kind of creatively bereft. I just mm-hmm. didn't have a lot of energy to put into anything creative, and I, I wasn't very interested. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a few songs. I'd written a few songs in the year or so leading up to his death. He had been sick, and um, and uh, not all about him necessarily, but just songs. Mm-hmm. And I'd written some songs uh, in those six months after he died. And I'd also written some essays and stuff that I'd never really done before that kind of a thing. And I just didn't know where all of this stuff belonged. But what I did know is that for the first time in my life, it didn't feel like, Oh, well I have about five songs written, so I should get on writing another five or six and I'll have an, I'll have a new album to record. And that just held absolutely no interest for me. Mm. Um, I had no desire to record an album and then go out and play some shows and sell some albums. And it just, it just seemed empty. Um, and so it dawned on me at, at, at one point that uh, this, it, was, it truly was like a light bulb going off. Mm-hmm. I, I had been searching the internet for something one day and I came across this guy who was doing a one-man show uh, in a theater in New York, um, a theatrical thing. And all of a sudden, I kind of saw myself. I said, oh my goodness, I've been writing a musical. This is a musical. And then I kind of said to myself, oh shit, I don't know how to write a musical. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I was afraid for a month or two, I was afraid to even say it out loud to anyone. I said it out loud to my wife. Uh Uh, she was the only person and thank goodness she did not act like I was crazy. She acted like it was the most normal thing in the world. But, um, I just sat down to writing and Mm. writing every single day. And it was the first time in my life I had written as a job. Like mm. I got up and I would write whether I had something to say or not from right. about seven thirty in the morning until about noon. Mm. And sometimes it would be with a guitar in my hand and sometimes not. And yeah, I, in retrospect, something in me realized that, that theater was the container for this particular story, right. not a cycle of songs by themselves. Mm. And so, um, so that's how I fell into writing for musical theater. And, and it's thrilling because there are so many more um, paintbrushes you can use, yeah. you know? You right. know, so you're not just using, you know, tone and voice and rhythm to tell a story. You're also using, like, you can change the entire emotion of a moment with a shift in lighting. And you can change the entire emotion of a moment just in the body language of the person who just got spoken to or who spoke something to someone. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's staging, it's, it's, it's the set, it's the lighting, it's everything. It's right. underscoring stuff with music. So it's, um, it kind of makes my mind whirl a little bit. And of course, I don't do all of that. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it is incredibly uh, collaborative in a way that even being in a band is not, um, you really have to trust each one of these artists, whether it's the costume designer or, um, the lighting director or the sound designer, um, or the director director. Um, you have to trust that each of them brings their own little paintbrush to this and to create a larger painting, a larger Mm -hmm. picture. It's really thrilling and really hard. And, um, it just gutted me, yeah. you know. And so now you're doing another one. And so now <laughs> I figured it didn't hurt enough the first time. <laughs> so what's uh, a blue poppy about? 
Blue Poppy is pretty excited. I'm, I'm really excited about this. So it's it's another new experience for me because I'm not writing the script to this. Or oh, as light okay. years, I wrote I wrote the script and the music and lyrics, everything. Mm. Um, again, I didn't really know better that that people don't often do all those things together. <laughs> but right. um, <laughs> um, but uh, this time uh, the. Eric Schaefer, no relation to me, is right. the person who is the artistic director at Signature Theater here in D.C. and who was the director for Light Years. And he set me up on a blind date with a playwright. Mm. Um, he has this, uh, she's, a, she's a playwright from Scotland. Her name is Grace Barnes. And invited us both over to dinner at his house a few months back um, saying that she had an idea for a show and she had described to him what she hoped the music might be sort of like. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, she said, I think it should be sort of an anti-Broadway musical. It should have more sort of, it should be sort of an Americana sort of folk uh, style uh, music. And there should be sort of this ethereal or mystical aspect to it. And <laughs> Eric said, oh, I know that guy. Right. Um, and so he asked me over and we hit it off right away. And, um, and so, yeah, we've been working on this show called the blue poppy, um, uh, completely virtually because she's in Scotland and I'm here in DC. Cool. Um, Although we will be we'll be writing for uh, a few days together in London uh, at the end of next month, so I'm excited about that. But the Blue Poppy is um, the story. Is, I call it an Irish Jewish ghost story. Nice. Um, yeah, sh- it is essentially uh, a tale of redemption, and her idea for it is that the show opens. Um, it opens in 1982 in England, and. We have a, a middle-aged man named Michael, and he lives on a houseboat, and he is kind of a loner. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't want anybody near him. He just keeps himself shut out from the outside world. There's even a, a woman who's a peace activist and her young daughter living on a houseboat next to them, and they try to be friends with him. He doesn't want any part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, his houseboat even kind of looks like nobody lives there in a weird way. Um, And he, uh, the one thing we do see him doing is he goes out on the Thames River and um, rows every day. Mm -hmm. Um, It's maybe exercise, but there's something about it that's a little sort of aggressive, almost even violent uh, Mm -hmm. about this rowing that he does every day. So um, eventually we will learn, uh, actually toward the end, that the reason he is there is that um, and we do, we learn this bit by bit by bit is that, that Michael was, uh, is in the witness protection program. He was part of the IRA. Oh. And so he is Irish and the IRA for some who may not be of the age to know, um, uh, was a part of the separatist movement in Northern Ireland and, uh, largely considered by a lot of the outside world to be a terrorist organization. Uh, they wanted Northern Ireland to be uh, a separate Republic from, uh, from the United Kingdom, from Mm -hmm. England. And so they would engage in bombings and shootings and all of these kinds of things at times, as well as being a political entity. So, um, anyway, Michael is in witness protection because he would, uh, hand make bombs for the IRA and one of his bombs went off and actually um, maimed and killed some children. Oh, wow. So now he's in, um, in witness protection for the rest of his life and he's living on this houseboat in England and as he goes rowing back and forth every day, he starts to have these visions of a young woman who calls to him and says, I need your help and her hand is stretched out to him. I need your boat and I need you come with me. Mm -hmm. And first of all, he doesn't want anything to do with the rest of the world. So he ignores her. And second of all, he's not really sure it's real. You know, she's sort of a vision, sort of a dream. Um, And, you know, he thinks he's just kind of hallucinating, but she comes back again and again saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So eventually after Michael reaches sort of hits rock bottom because he meets with his handler and wants to see his own family one more time, Michael does. And his handler says, you can never see your family again. You know, you'll all be killed if you go back. 
he realizes his life is just everything he knew and loved is gone. So the next time that this young woman appears to him while he's out rowing and she stretches out her hand, he, he takes it. And they are pushed through the fog. And on the other side of that, they show up in Denmark in 1943. I told you it got weird. Wow, okay, nice. <laughs> I know, I know, kind of strange. This, this is a little exciting. time travel thing on stage. I don't know, I don't know how it's going to work, but that's not oh, my job. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I think it could be really gorgeous. I think this is why Eric really wants to do it, um, mm-hmm. to direct it. Mm-hmm. But, he, so the story I didn't know that Grace did know and, and is writing this about is that um, historically, in 1943 in Denmark, did you know that Um, As the Nazis tried to round up all the Jews of Denmark, the citizens of Denmark, just normal citizens, smuggled over 90% of Danish Jews to safety over in Sweden. I didn't know that. Me me neither. And my dad was a Holocaust survivor and I didn't know it. Wow. Incredible. And the way they did this was there's a strait of water between Denmark and Sweden, uh, the Orison Strait, which at its narrowest is only three miles. So they would literally smuggle Jews from every part of the country, um, keep them overnight in churches or basements or wherever, and then put them on boats um, and take them the three miles to Sweden in the middle of the night. Wow. And some of these boats were motor boats and some of them were rowboats. And Michael all of a sudden finds himself in 1943 in Denmark with an opportunity to atone mm. by rowing children and people to safety Gosh. across the Orson Strait. Holy yeah. smokes. <laughs> Pretty powerful, right? That's great. Yeah. So it's, it's about some other things as well. It's also, mm-hmm. there's, there's a love story in the middle of this that, um, again, happens over time, uh-huh. um, meaning over different periods of time, um, uh, different eras, sure. but, um, it's a really, really beautiful story and she's right at the beginning of it. We're both right at the beginning of it, meaning that she didn't come to me with a script. She came to me with an idea And so we're kind of writing it together in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So far, she's written a first draft, and I've written um, maybe three and a half songs for it. Wow. Um, But we're just kind of... I mean, she knows how the whole story goes and how it's going to end and all of that. But of course, you know, as I was saying before about Light Years, so much will change between now and whenever it's in some sort of finished state ready to be produced. So. But I'm really excited because I'm a, it's a new experience for me artistically to just write the music and lyrics and work in, in partnership with Mm -hmm. another artist in this way, um, and develop a story. But B, I, um, I love the story Mm. and yet it's, it's not like, it's emotional to me. It's beautiful. It's profound. And yet it's not my story, <laughs> the way The Light Years was. No, no, no. But it's based in truth, and it's based in something that mattered. And so that's... Yes. It seems like it's almost still filling that urge for you, you know, to, to, to do things that matter, to do things that have meaning. And this story is one that, gosh, has to be told. So even if it's, you know, a little supernatural, <laughs> but yeah, it's a beautiful story, and I can't, I can't wait to, to hear it. Thanks. Yeah, me too. I, I can't wait to see how it grows and how it turns out. And, and it, it does fill that void. I, I'm not interested um, in, in making things that don't have something to say. Right. And that doesn't necessarily mean they have to have a fist in the air and have a message of course. Uh, in, in, in a political sense or even a moral sense, but they should have something to say. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, somebody once said to me, Hey, you know, music, like it doesn't always have to be so like intense. It, it doesn't have to cure cancer, you know? Mm. And, and I said, yeah, but it should try. Yeah. It'd be nice uh, if it could try. It'd be to. nice. Yeah. yeah. If at least it could try. And, and, and I, I know that's hyperbole, but that's kind of how I move forward with anything that I make these days. Is it trying to do something, um, 
substantive in the world? Is it trying to say something of substance? Of substance? Is it trying to help people to understand themselves and the world they live in a little bit better? Hopefully, even if it's just telling a very small personal story, sometimes those things tell it the best. Mm. Wow. Well, it's a great story, and uh, and yours is a great story. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I love I Thanks. loved uh, hearing it, and and like I said before, man, it's been it has been a joy to just witness uh, your career. You know, not just with with Eddie from Ohio, but just as a as a songwriter, as a uh, humanitarian, as a and now as a playwright. <laughs> And, mm. and so it's, it's exciting to see that. And, and, and I do hope that you can make it up at some point, come back to, come back to Ohio sometime and, um, or I'll try yeah, to make it too. to, I'll try to make it up to Northern Virginia. Yeah. But no, we'd love, we'd love to get to Ohio, whether it's, whether it's us or me or whatever, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, I would love to get over there cool. again. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, thank you for saying, for saying all that. I think, I think I, I know I get bored easily. Mm. Um, and you know, there's some downsides to that, but the upside is that I feel like, um, I get to dive into new things and Mm. sometimes, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But, um, that's, what's exciting to me is, is there's an aspect to being an artist that I think is really important. And that is making yourself sometimes actively uncomfortable on a regular basis. Mm. And um, yeah. and I don't love feeling uncomfortable, but I love what comes of it. Right. That's where the movement happens. Yeah, always. Well, cool, man. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Dan. I really enjoyed this. I had a dream last night. Everything was beautiful. Everything was a spark in the heart of darkness, of wonder and blue. I had a dream last night, everything was all right, all right. Everybody was a small light in a dark room. Look like Chinese lanterns swaying in the wind. It felt like waves of fireflies breathing out, breathing in. And you sounded like starlight whispers. Robbie Schaefer is one deep dude. I've always sensed that about him, even when he was on stage with Eddie from Ohio, whose energy level is usually just off the charts. Hey, head over to this episode's page at danheight.com. You'll find videos, uh, including a video of this song you're listening to right now, which is also from Light Years, uh, links, and more about Robbie. If you want to support him even further, he's got a Patreon page where you can get updates and video clips, uh, listen to his own podcast where he talks a lot about his own work uh, in progress and past progress and previews of songs that he's writing for the Blue Poppy and all of this stuff on the Patreon page. It's totally worth the five bucks a month that you throw his way. All right, guys, that's all I got. I'm going to shut up so you can listen to this. Thanks again so much for listening to this podcast. And let's go make some stories. Uh 